Hello, and welcome back to another edition of the Weekly News Roundup from Catholic Family News. I'm Brian McCall, and I'm happy to be joined by Mary Rundis. Uh, we are in the second uh, week after Easter and uh, still enjoying this great uh, season of Easter. A lot of different stories going on uh, this week that we have to uh, discuss with you. First, uh, the De Decastery for the Doctrine of the Faith released a new doctor document supposedly clarifying the concept of human dignity. But in typical modernist fashion, a lot of the clarifications are anything but. Uh, we'll give you some comments on that document. Um, next, we're going to look at what appears to be a concerted effort of Hollywood to attack Catholicism. And when they attack Catholicism, it's interesting that it always has a traditional bent. Um, we're going to do a roundup of a couple interesting stories in the development of uh, abortion in the United States, in Florida and Arizona, and then talk about the statement that uh, former President Donald Trump came out with about abortion. Then finally, we have a kind of an international relations news roundup of various stories uh, across the Middle East and Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, to kind of give perspective on, on what's been happening. So um, today is the feast of Saint uh, Leo the First, great Pope and martyr. And uh, you wanted to share some thoughts, Murray, with us about uh, the great saint. Yeah, absolutely. And before we get into all that, a reminder to our audience to please like this video. That helps uh, spread the word of Catholic Family News. And also, if you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, whether that be uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, give us a five star review. That helps us out a lot as well. But yeah, Pope St. Leo the Great, one of the greatest popes of all time, uh, and, and certainly uh, of the first millennium. Pope St. Leo the Great, a, a key player in the Christological uh, debates, making sure that the, the Council of Chalcedon um, ran smoothly, played a, a, um, a big role there. And he also produced a document that's well known as being an example of extraordinary jurisdiction, a good example of papal teaching infallibly. And that was Pope St. Leo's tomb uh, or, or tome. Uh, that's a, a, a key document when arguing with someone like uh, an Eastern, Eastern Orthodox or a Protestant because it displays very early on in church history the Roman pontiff had a strong role that he had to play in not just directing the church uh, on disciplinary matters, but also having that ability to define doctrine with the same authority of, let's say, an ecumenical council. So Pope St. Leo the Great, an amazing saint, uh, and also great on a personal level. Of course, there's that, that great, great story with Pope St. Leo the Great uh, defending um Rome defending uh, mm. Western Europe from uh, Attila the Hun. There's that that story mm. of him uh, rebuffing him, sending him back. Uh, that that um, great invader, if we want to call him great in the, the great. <laughs> very devastating sense, great uh, Pope Saint Leo sent him back. So that's an example of God working through the Roman Pontiff, working through the mm. Church in order to save Western civilization. So we have to ask for his intercession today. No, and it's interesting about that that story, the sort of modern skeptics. Um, you know, the, the story as it's come from antiquity is Attila's at the gates of Rome, Leo marches out uh you know to meet him, uh carrying nothing but the cross, and Attila sees this basically a horde of angels um in the sky appear and he basically thinks these, these i can't fight this and and goes and then of course like all these modern have to modernists have to say oh it was an i was he was like uh hallucinating there was some reflection of the sun like they they just can't accept uh a, a miraculous intervention in history at this critical time for christianity and it's kind of infancy just having emerged from the roman uh, persecution and you know the the sparing of the world of this devastation by the intercession of the pope in a miraculous event but uh, it's a beautiful picture in the vatican of leo greed turning away attila at the gates of rome but uh, i'll stick to the story as handed down mm -hmm. um also coming up this sunday is the second sunday after uh, easter known as good shepherd sunday because the 
gospel is the gospel of our Lord saying he proclaiming himself as the bon pastor, the good, good pastor. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Um, and it's particularly a day that's often dedicated to praying for and fostering vocations um, because we need true shepherds who are not hirelings, uh, who are not going to flee for fear of the wolves. Um, and really, it's, that's why it's a good day to pray, particularly for seminarians uh, who are studying to become good pastors, to dispose their soul to work with the grace of ordination. So uh, if you know any particular seminarians, might be a good day to, to offer prayers for them, if not in general, to pray for, for uh, vocations. Yeah, for sure. Well, we are going to start off with another document. I don't know, had I hadn't heard a lot of rumors that this one was coming. Had, had, had you been expecting this one or have you heard anything? Yeah, this was expected uh, last yeah. week, but it's, it's interesting because um, this document has been in the works for years. Yeah. And many have speculated that the reason for that is they wanted to make sure that they could publish this on that anniversary of the Declaration of the hum of Human Rights um, from, from the UN, which we should note, and we'll get into this, um, yeah. is a document based on the rights of man. It's a document based on the French Revolution. So yes. I think that's what they were waiting for. And it is a bit surprising, though, that we didn't hear this um, – months before but they they have yeah. been working on this for years we know that uh, maybe it was <laughs> wishful optimism on my part i had heard about it and then it kind of fell off and i thought okay maybe it got scrapped but uh yeah unfortunately not <laughs> well and again the the focus of the document is human dignity dignitas infinita infinite dignity and um as, as Mary said, it was released on this anniversary of the UN Declaration of the Rights of, of Man, which is essentially traces directly to the French Revolution, to liberal Freemasonic principles. Uh, but it's it's got a, long, a history in the modern church. This concept of dignity uh, was really, as I said, one of the key bulwarks used at Vatican II to push forward a lot of the sociological changes or changes in they talk about anthropology uh, through through Vatican II. And there's sort of two key aspects of Vatican II that I think are important to get on the table before we look at this document because it it furthers the, the problems with them. Um, one is a statement that uh, in the documents that the Son of God in a certain way has united himself with every human being uh, through the incarnation and references to all men have been saved by Christ's uh, redemption. This is a, 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 a bombshells that were dropped into Vatican II, which are really meant to explode the idea of, of sort of super ecumenism of essentially uh, the theory of Karl Rahner of anonymous Christians that sort of everybody saved and the goal of the church is just sort of let people know what happened to them uh, as opposed to everyone has the possibility of salvation through Christ. Christ merits enough for all to be saved, but whether any individual people are saved uh, is a function of whether they accept the Catholic Church and 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 unite themselves to her. Um, so that's the first. The second is really Digitatis Humanae, which the title obviously links to the, the human dignity, the Declaration on Religious Freedom, which basically says that this false uh, condemned error of that all people are are free, even within due limits, but are free to practice whatever religion seems best to them. Uh, by virtue of human dignity, because of their human dignity, that this right comes from uh, human dignity. And you'll see this document cites to, to both of those passages, both of those concepts uh, from Vatican II uh, in, it, in its argument. But I want to start with what's interesting is they say, it was kind of a hopeful statement in the very beginning, um, that, you know, church has talked about dignity, but there's been certain confusion connected with the term human dignity. And it my first optimistic reaction was, oh, they're finally going to fix this and, and, and explain that all this modernism is, you know, misunderstanding and it's wrong. Uh, and but no, they their their clarifications, uh, essentially their fundamental clarification that they refer to in part A um, doesn't really help. What they essentially do in this part of the document is um, 
how to distinguish these various types of dignity, ontological, moral, societal, and existential. And first of all, I can't figure out the difference between ontological and existential. They try to distinguish them. It, it's like reading Kant. I, the, the distinction doesn't really seem to work, and they seem to be confused themselves about the distinction. If I can add something real quick sure. on that, uh, yeah. it, the, it sounds like Kant because they explicitly say <laughs> right. that they are influenced by Kant. That's it's true. Very, it's, it's very strange. The only – there's very limited um, non-Pope Francis citations well, in this yes. document. Really, it's just self-referential. Yes. But – in one of those places, they cite Kant as a, a, yes. a modern mind who were greatly influenced by, who greatly influenced um, Christian thought on this matter. So it's definitely in that vein, and yes. it's definitely in the vein of not being Thomistically precise. It's kind of just uh, the the modern ramblings of a philosopher that we might expect. The, the, the terms, I don't think they would even say need to be precise. It's just sort of uh, we're going willy-nilly. I, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's funny, we both picked up on that. It is, it is very Kantian. And the fact that the Catholic Church in an official document would cite Immanuel Kant, a heretic, not even really sure he believed in God, <laughs> I mean, to be right. honest, uh, is in and of itself uh, scandalous, I would say. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the self-referential, I mean, this is like classic Fratelli Tutti Francis documents. It's all self-referential. Uh, as the magisterium, i.e. me, has said many times, you know, and uh, again, it's Vatican, the, the most citations are to Pope Francis, then Vatican II. Um, there's one citation to Thomas Aquinas in a very vague way. Uh, but again, it certainly exhibits that, that characteristic. But the interesting part where, again, there was an opportunity to bring about a correction, not just a clarification, is this distinction between ontological and moral dignity, right? Because this is this distinction that Vatican II tried to blur. All human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. True. Whether you become Catholic or not, you are created in the image and likeness of God, and you have that dignity of your human nature, right? That's true. But we can forfeit and affect, sort of basically degrade that dignity by our behavior. So our behavior can, you know, by sinning, by, by uh, you know, leaving God, it doesn't mean we're just sort of guaranteed to have this human dignity. We can damage it. Um, and in fact, we have damaged it. And that's why the prayer from the offertory um, that was removed by the Novus Ordo because it didn't go along with this new idea of dignity. When the priest blesses the water, when he's preparing the chalice, he says, oh God, who has you know created human dignity, but even more wonderfully restored it, right? Reminds us that dignity is not something that you know, is just guaranteed to us. It's something we can lose and need to be restored. And they sort of hint at this, at the idea of moral dignity, but then they cut back from it. And they're like, well, you can, you can sin and sort of hurt your moral dignity, but you're still, you know, you're still, it's all still there. And, and they include this statement um, that Christ has not only united himself to all human, every human being in a certain way, their favorite phrase, certain way Christ has united himself to all human beings, but has redeemed all human beings. Uh, that again, gives this idea everybody's good. We don't really need salvation or to do anything. Right. Yes. And I, I want to, it's, I want to show some of the um, actual document it, itself and, yeah. and read some of it as well. Uh, yeah. Let's see, I'll pull up some of it here. I, Cause I want to share about to, to our audience about something that I think is, um, it really does get at the, the root of the problem here when it comes to a, a fundamentally different view on how to, to view our yes. our religion, which yes. has to do with, um, as as Brian mentioned, this old conciliar idea that by Christ's incarnation, that's enough to to raise up um, uh, man's dignity to the point of, and we've we've seen this taken to excess of everyone is saved from that. And one thing that they make clear on this is. Uh, how they talk about the single criterion of judgment. We see this in paragraph 12 here, hmm. where I, I want to read some of this. They say, 
The glorious Christ will judge by the love of neighbor that consists in ministering to the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned with whom he identifies. For Jesus, the good done to every human being, regardless of the ties of blood or religion. Listen to that. Regardless of the ties nice. of blood or religion is the single criterion of judgment. Now, there's a lot of things in this document that I think you can uh, try to, to fit, fit in with traditional Catholic views of philosophy and theology. This is one I absolutely don't think you can. Yeah. What it ends up doing is makes us as it makes our religion into something of a, a caricature that you'd see from a Protestant, a works based salvation saying the only criterion of judgment is how you treat other people, for example. This is not Catholicism. And to those trying to justify this, notice what it says. It says, regardless of the ties of blood or religion. Again, St. Paul would people. differ. He'd say, without, without faith, without charity, I am a you know, clanging gong and a symbol that my works are of no merit without being in the state of sanctifying grace. No, it, I, that, and that's yes. true. And yes. we'll talk about how the, the scripture goes completely against it. Yes. And something I think that's interesting from this document is that it goes beyond just talking about how Christ's incarnation is what makes our dignity so great. The the development in their, in their spin on this seems to now be that it's just by us being made in the image of God that makes right. us and it makes it enough that, to raise our, our dignity up for the new conciliar religion, which I think this is a confirmation that this is that just being made in the image of God is enough to raise your dignity up to an infinite sense, an infinite mm -hmm. uh, dignity. Something I wanted to quote from Father Thomas Crean, who's done a great job mm. uh, analyzing this document, is he quoted St. Thomas Aquinas, who said, No mere man was of infinite dignity so as to make adequate satisfaction for an offense against God. That's from De Rationibus Fidei, chapter 7, from St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm. And this is important, right, because this is at the, the core of traditional Catholic um traditional Catholic theology and soteriology is that man being a limited creature, a finite creature does not, cannot have infinite characteristics because if we did, then we could make up for the sin of Adam. But in fact, uh, we don't have that infinite dignity. We are finite creatures that cannot have infinite characteristics. And so we needed God to become man. That's why the incarnation is so important. So as to make up for that offense, this document goes against that completely. Do you have anything else to add on that, Brian? I mean, there's a lot here that I mean, we're talk about, but on yeah. that issue, I think that issue no. is the core of this. It is the core that is sort of philosophically wrong with this. I mean, aside from this, essentially, before again, there's one other specific I want to get to, but essentially, this document is in the vein of what Vatican II wanted to do, which Cardinal Swenens said, was the 1789 in the church, as as Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict said, we, we just need to reconcile with the modern world, kind of accept the French Revolution, accept all of this. This is now accept the UN, and we're part of the club. And again, that overall, I would say, is one of the major uh, problems with the document. But but the other thing I want to talk about, and maybe if you, since it's on your screen, if you want to scan down, they, towards the end, have this list of kind of all the bad things that people do against human dignity. Oh, uh, yes. And there's just a lot there in terms we could talk about. But I mean, first of all, there's some good. They obviously say, you know, there's grave violations of human dignity. Um, so first of all, they start off with the drama of poverty. So again, this is the communist socialist bent that's been given since Pope Francis. Uh, of all of the crimes that have been committed and horrendous things, he starts with poverty, um, not abortion, not even war. Like that comes second. Uh, it's just really interesting. Um, but then again, he goes on with war, um, abortion. Good that that's mentioned, right? Um, but then it starts to sort of um, um, break down the travail of migrants. So again, it, it reads like a Democratic Party platform at this point, uh, with the exception of abortion getting mentioned. Uh, human trafficking, again, good that 
there's some attention being drawn to that. Uh, sexual abuse, kind of ironic coming from uh, Pope Francis, who's you know covered up sexual abuse, uh, pardoned, ex- remitted the excommunication of Father Rupnik. Okay, we'll put that aside. <laughs> but <laughs> um, violence against women. There we finally get to abortion down here, down in the list. Um, but then the real troubling stuff, we get surrogacy. And that's nice that say that not a clear statement against IVF, which I think would be good there because that, that also, but just more generally surrogacy. Um, I think that's good. When we get to the talking about abortion in this country that that was mentioned. Euthanation assisted suicide. Again, another good thing that that's mentioned. But we're going to get down to gender theory. Um, and again, here's where we kind of go off the rails. First of all, they keep using this term, which has never been used before the modern Vatican of sexual orientation. And again, language really matters. Sort of using the phrase concedes, oh, this is just, you know, a, an orientation. This is just like, I like chocolate, not a perversity, a dangerous temptation. Right. It's using the language of liberalism to just sort of say, like, again, saying this whole overboard must not be discriminated against. But but previous, even in John Paul II, these terms were never used. It was it was never used to sort of concede the vocabulary. Um, So that's the first thing jumped right out at me immediately. It's just sort of accepting this narrative that this is just, you know, just the way these people are, as opposed to being a grave you know, a grave depravity that, that, or as the psychological community admitted to the 1970s, a, a disorder. Um, but then they get into this comp- complex thing of gender theory where it's kind of, yeah, this is, this is bad. We shouldn't do it. But uh, again, it's kind of a half-hearted, we don't really want to offend you. Um, and, and one of the strangest things they say, you know, no m- mutilation, well, but except unless there is something you're born with that isn't quite right, right? It's kind of like why that? Why did they have to say that? Um, it, it, it because what the liberal interpretation is exactly what they say. I'm not born right. I wasn't supposed to have these body parts because I'm supposed to be a woman, and it just sort of the last little line there muddied the waters uh, a little bit, uh, and just wasn't you know, very, very, it made it not as clear an explanation of what's wrong here in the sex change part below. So I don't know, is that, do you have some other thoughts on this sort of list of shame that? I do. And it's something that's hidden in uh, paragraph 34. And Uh this is going to be, this is a, of course, it's been in the making. We we saw this with Pope Francis's changing of the catechism, but in paragraph 34, we see ah, yes. uh, the mention of the death penalty. Now, yes. uh, when talking a- about the, the death penalty, they, they, they say, I'll, I'll read it exactly. Here, one should also mention the death penalty, for this also violates the inalienable dignity of every person, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, recently, I went in w- on on Twitter with Eric Yabara, and, and he he looked into the original um, Italian because this wasn't written in Latin. Because apparently mm. the Catholic Church doesn't write anything in Latin anymore. <laughs> yeah. But in the Italian, regardless of the circumstances, is indeed there. That it, this is a a direct translation. That is a a change in teaching because, of course, yes. the Catholic Church, as uh, Doctor Fazer has put so well in his book. Uh, traditionally taught that the, the, the death penalty, and one can even make the argument it's infallibly taught, and I think it's mm. almost certain that the ordinary and universal magisterium has taught that, the de- that the death penalty is permissible in certain circumstances. Now, many of the uh, Pope Francis is amazing, Pope Pope Francis, Splainer, Co- yes. Crowd are going to say, well, actually, you know, w- what he's saying here. Um, it does violate the dignity, but we're, it, you're allowed to violate the dignity uh, on some occasions. But you need to look in the full. Ah, context that's not what this says. <laughs> it, yeah, it says regardless of the circumstances, yeah. and it it what does it put it next to? It puts it against to subhuman living conditions, slavery, prostitution, yeah. the selling of women and children. It's on that level of evil. That argument is not going to work in defending this. This You're either going to have to say that this is a change in teaching and that teaching is incorrect or that this is a, a, a change in teaching and we need to do what the church has always taught in this regard. 
I also wanted to mention two other quick things, which is and, one. And just bef before you leave that to the next thing, one other mm -hmm. thought. This is the distinction that's been completely lost is that there's because, again, they want to have this dignity no matter what. There's a fundamental difference between an innocent person and a person who is guilty. So abortion, regardless of the circumstances, is always wrong because you're always dealing with an innocent, a person who is in, incapable of being guilty for anything. Um, same thing, you know, again, with somebody who's in, enslaved or trafficked, they're innocent. But when you're dealing with the death penalty, you're dealing with someone that is guilty of a crime and that changes the entire calculus. But they, they just sort of want to run all those together, that killing and the death penalty is the same thing without focusing on this fundamental difference that they allude to as moral dignity, but then just sort of drop and don't don't even employ. Yes. And it's and that's going to be a huge problem with yes. with, with the document is in yes. the conflation of terms only adds to that as well. Um, if we also if we also look, we, we talked about the origins of this in Vatican II. looked in paragraph four. You can see it again goes along with this error of religious liberty. They say um, it, the, this indignity is infringed on the individual level when due regard is not had for values such as freedom, the right to profess one's own uh, to profess one's religion, not the true religion. Right. This could mean Satanism. This can mean Islam. It's an evil if one is prevented from doing this. So, uh, again, that's a, a huge problem. And the, the final thing I'll mention is later on in the document, it talks about how the um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose 75th anniversary we, cel re we recently celebrated, as I, I mentioned at the, the start of this, it says these principles are self-evident and commonly accepted. Now, again, I, I don't want to nitpick the document, but again, this is coming from the Vatican and should be expected to be highly literate yes. in this regard. When we're saying things like self-evident, human rights are self-evident, well, to most people, it's not self-evident, even if we're taking this in a loose sense. Um, in the traditional sense, we'd say self-evident is something like the principle of non-contradiction, something where if the terms are presented, it's just naturally going to come to the mind. Uh, and be accepted by the mind. But in this regard, human rights, that's something that's highly predicated on Christian values. If you watch some of our other weekly yes. news roundups, we talked about Richard Dawkins, for example, calling himself a, a cultural Christian. Uh, Richard Dawkins makes the, mis the same mistake here that it would seem that the Vatican office does, which is saying that, well, this can be assumed by anyone. In fact, no, human rights are highly predicated on Western culture and God. You need God in order to get those human rights. Um, there's been many prominent uh, people recently who have denied human rights on that basis, uh, denied the existence of them, calling for, for new ways of thinking. And this is a, an example of really not, not thinking this through completely. It's not self-evident in that sense. Mo many people don't accept them. So, again, there's a lot wrong in this document. Mm -hmm. I don't like accepting even the good because it's predicated on that Yes. Uh, th this false foundation of a false understanding of dignity. So I must say, I'm not a fan. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's unfortunate because there were these opportunities to to make a correction that that clearly they were not interested in in making. As Francis has done, he just wants to double down on Vatican II, essentially. Yes. So. Well, we spent a lot of time on that story, but there was definitely a lot um, to to discuss. Um, and uh, we're going to then go on to our our next story, which uh, relates to Hollywood. And what both yes. of us, it's interesting, as we were preparing for this, kind of said there seems to be a um, concerted effort to mock, blaspheme the Catholic Church uh, through um, media, through the media. And related to that, what's interesting is they know what to use. So they're not putting in a balloon clown mass Novus Ordo to mock, but things that have an aesthetic that is related to traditional traditionalism. So um, I want to play a clip first. This one I got from Gloria TV, and it's a commercial that is apparently running in Italy 
again, Pope St. Pius X, Pius XII must be rolling in their graves to think that mm. this is allowed now to happen uh, in Italy. It's a commercial for a potato chip um, uh, company. So here it is. <laughs> Amica Chips, il divino quotidiano. So, so again, there you you have it. And again, no Catholics in Italy seem to be expressing outrage that they're mocking the Blessed Sacrament to sell Ruffles-looking potato chips, right? Um, but if you look at the video, you know they again they what do they they do? They have nuns dressed in traditional habits. They're not playing gentlewoman or uh, oh, what's another glory and praise song? They're playing Ave Maria, right? They're playing right. a traditional looking church. Uh, he's not wearing a a uh, Father Martin stole rainbow stole. It's all sort of very traditional. Used to sort of use the Blessed Sacrament as this sort of mocking uh, use of potato chips. Ironically we reported a couple stories where there were priests using tortilla chips to invalidly uh, try to confect a sacrament. So the irony of it is that the Novus Ordo itself is sort of often mocking what's going on here. Um, but that, that was sort of our first example. But then there's two films that were recently uh, released. And just let our viewers know, it looks like Mary, Mary's not at uh, home right now. He's, he's overseas. And his camera doesn't seem to be working. So rather than just looking at a blank screen, that's why I'm, I think I shipped <laughs> that off. So you'll, he's, he's the voice from above that the, uh, uh like, it would seem, yeah, it seems right. my, my camera is uh, allergic to the Irish air here, right. but I will show that, uh, I will show the poster of this film, yes. uh, which I, I really, we can't show much of, um, uh, of, of some of the things we're going to talk about because it's um the, these films are really just of that blasphemous nature. But the first, the, the first film and both of these films are coming out this year is a, uh, uh, or have come out is uh, immaculate by, um, and the, the main actress in this is uh, Sydney Sweeney, uh, which I, I, I've talked to Brian about many, mm -hmm. uh, even traditional and conservative Catholics have been fawning over this woman, um, which people need to stop and especially because of this film we have uh there's been numerous films trying to make traditional looking nuns into something demonic something that is um evil something that is is wicked and repulsive that is a good uh um example of that uh another one is called the first omen which is another horror film that focuses on um uh religious sisters um taking place in convents bringing about the antichrist and all of this has a, a purpose which is trying to make traditional catholic aesthetics seem to, to be something evil to the um uh, to to everyone in the world we've recently uh we've it's been talked about on this show with pop stars like sabrina carpenter doing blasphemous things in um churches and we recently this week we've also seen additional pop stars like rihanna taking blasphemous photo shoots in nun outfits uh, dressing up as religious sisters. This is, and what I think the, the main point is is that they're not taking Novus Ordo aesthetics. They're taking traditional Catholic aesthetics and they're trying to make it um, into something evil. They know that these things are powerful, that our eyes are powerful tools, and that if we they can get it to be associated with something wicked, then that that's the ultimate victory for the devil. Yeah, and it's interesting if you read about, and I would never see these films, but read a little bit about the plot. What clearly comes through, and this is why I think they use the traditional trappings or aesthetics, is the religious superiors are all occult, evil, and 
are looking to abuse women. And I think it's interesting, even secular commentators on both of these movies, because I took a look at some of them, are saying these movies are a direct result of the Dobbs decision on abortion, um, because what they focus on is the la they call the loss of bodily autonomy of women. So in each of these sort of crazed horror plots, these religious superiors are essentially trying to use these nuns and impregnate them. They use that one to like produce the Antichrist. The irony there is they basically, the one film, they want to create the Antichrist to get more people to go to church because if the Antichrist is around, there'll be more people in church. This uh, absurd what they're trying to do. But what's interesting is that they are really saying women losing their right to abortion. That's how they're describing it. And it, it's that I think really interesting to to observe that they then are then associating that with traditional looking and sounding religious figures yes and it's it's interesting because you know they have a whole philosophy behind feminist horror it's it's something where they they use this as an excuse to be as as blasphemous as possible they'll say well this is just showing the the horror that women face on on a daily basis but it's no excuse for this kind of blasphemy, and, and it really um, it cannot be had. So, um, of course, to, to our audience, don't go see these films. And yes. you know that that sounds obvious, but at the same time, um, it's marketed in a way where you could see it as like, oh, is this a film about a nun? You see the, the posters yes. uh, and things like that. No, these are demonic films, uh, and it's these are often produced by the same people. Uh, you can find those those people out online. Many of them come from the same background. Um, these these aren't Catholics looking to get your soul to heaven. This is a part of a a small group of people trying to ruin the name of Catholicism in the world. Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Well, it does sort of throw the flow to our next story, which is kind of an update on uh, the horror of abortion in our country. Before turning to that, though, I do want to remind all of you of our affiliate programs, which is another way you can help support this apostolate. We currently have programs with Sophie Institute Press, Tan Books, and Angelico Press, all three of whom have affiliate links that if you buy books after clicking through that link that will tag your purchase as coming from Catholic Family News and a portion of your proceeds of purchase will be donated to support our apostolate. So links to each of those affiliates uh, are below in the video. And if you're going to be looking for some good spiritual or Catholic reading, consider buying from one of those three through uh, our affiliate program. But as I said, our next story, uh, a lot of news coming out of abortion. One of these stories happened a few weeks ago. But we didn't cover it in a prior news program. But uh, the state of Florida passed a six-week abortion ban, which, as particularly the critics point out, virtually bans all abortions because it is essentially six weeks, um, and most people cannot detect a pregnancy until about the fifth or sixth week. So um, measuring from the end of the last cycle really is, is, is how you measure weeks. So you're probably, you know, only actually the baby conceived two or three weeks. Um, Florida passed that law. It was enjoined by the courts and said, can't enforce it. Um, it reached the Supreme Court of Florida. And this is why it's important to have good governors, good state legislatures. They have good judges on that court and they uh, up said the law can now be enforced. Um, so that is going, going into effect and will shut down that because because of the injunction against the law, many of the states around Florida are already enforcing that law. So the, the clinics were making a brisk business from neighboring southern states, and that will now uh, come, you know, come to an end pr pretty much. Um, so that was good news. The other good news comes from the other side of the Sun Belt, and that's in Arizona. Again, another court decision. This one's interesting. It enraged. Uh, the 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 main lamestream media. So Arizona in 1864, and it gets so funny. They're so upset about this. It shows how deep rooted laws in our country are against against restricting abortion. Right? They 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 try to run double narratives. Like one of their narratives was, oh, abortion was never really that illegal. Um, well, 1864, Arizona outlawed all abortions, and. The only exception is a doctor, if there was something done in trying to save the mother's life that might technically run afoul of the law, they wouldn't be punished, but it has no other exceptions, no time limit, nothing, banned. 
that rule after Roe v. Wade was enjoined from being enforced, but never overturned, never revoked by the legislature. It was there, but the court orders prevented it from being enforced. Well, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled now that Dobbs is the law of the land, there's nothing stopping that law from being uh, enforced. Now, sadly, um, there is a very radical governor uh, there, and she's basically said she's ordering no enforcement of the law, but at least it's now um, it was found to be that that's the law. So that's good news. The third part of this story is there's been a lot of pressure on former Do President Donald Trump to come out and say what his position now that Dobbs is the law is on abortion. And uh, specifically, would he support a federal law that would restrain, restrict or prohibit abortion um, in some way across the country as opposed to the state by state way? So he came out with a, a little video and basically uh, said, no, I will not support any federal action on this. It's, it's up to the states and let the states do what they want. Uh, but I'm not in favor of a, a ban like Florida's at six weeks. Well, you know, let's, you know, that, that's too extreme. The saddest part of it is the reasoning, because his reason is it's bad for business. We're losing, we, we won't get votes if we do that. Um, not a very principled stand where 2016, he took a fairly principled stand on abortion, took some heat for it. Um, but now he's like, ah, yeah, well, people won't vote for us if we, if we go for that. So let's drop it. Uh, really, really disappointing. Um, no, it wasn't just Donald Trump as well who came out a, a against this this abortion document. A, another key yeah. one was, of course, Carrie Lake, who's well, yes. uh, who's running for office over there uh, in, in Arizona. And, and her statement was, um, I mean, just just as what what Brian is is talking mm -hmm. about, it's not really what we want to see. We we want to see more clear uh, opposition against abortion that go, goes to the principled level level rather than. Um, just trying to get votes from people. We're not, I saw from Turning Point USA, a, a, a plea to just, well, we don't want to make this a referendum on abortion. Look, this is not a matter of uh, trying to be utilitarian and trying to get votes. We need at the end of the day uh, to oppose child murder and child sacrifice, which is what this is. We have to oppose it at all costs. And it's interesting. I've seen some Catholics defend this on the principle of subsidiarity, which is principle is you let the lower order do do things and don't have the higher order intervene and say, well, the states used to outlaw abortion. They can do it and the federal government shouldn't get involved. But they always forget the next principle of a subsidiarity, that if the lower order doesn't do it, then the federal or the higher authority has an obligation to step in if it's a grave matter. And so, yes, if when for 150 years, when every state outlawed abortion, there was really no reason for the federal government to intervene. But now when you have states like Illinois who are actually considering uh, making legal infanticide, people that survive abortions, that is when subsidiary would say the the, the higher form the higher government needs to step in because the lower government is neglecting its duty as under natural law. So again, I have nothing wrong with states outlawing abortion, but we really have to say if that's if if there are millions of hundreds and thousands of babies being killed in New York and California and Illinois and et cetera, then that's not a sufficient solution to just say, well, you know, at least we have these other states. Right. And we've heard this plea from Republicans to try to make this a, a state's right, it, rights issue. That falls apart if we start saying that it's wrong for the states to ban uh, abortion as well. So it's um, not a good direction for the Republicans, but um, it is better than the, the Democrats at this stage, but um, it's still not a good thing to see. Yeah. Well, yeah. Obviously, the Democrats are worse, but not right. not not very good. Well, we're going to look overseas and we have kind of a collection of um, things that have happened that uh, develop a lot of the stories we've talked about before. No, yes. So recently we've had a, um, a number of things were, were getting heated. We thought that there would have been some uh, progress being made in the, the Gaza re region with Israel and uh, Hamas there after Israel said that they were going to withdraw a lot of their troops uh, from that occupation. But uh, unfortunately, it's gotten much worse recently after an Israeli strike on a facility in Syria, which killed some important 
Iranian military figures. One of those um, one of those people was the a, a main man in the the Quds Force, Q U D S Force, which is one of Iran's. Um, uh, branches of the military to try to spread its ideology in the re region. And by killing that man, it's it's definitely escalated things uh, quite a bit. Iran has threatened retaliation, and Israel uh, threatened that they would bomb Iran itself and all of its um, nuclear facilities if Iran escalated things at all. So that's caused, of course, some, some escalation. And uh, in Ukraine itself, we've seen some, some problems to the point where even the United Nations has had to get their nuclear prevention task force together after an attack on Russia's energy sector led to Russia bombing um, a, a big portion of Kyiv's energy sector. So the war is raging on in both areas. And, and something that I wanted to say is that, uh, well, people are, are getting tired of this. People are getting tired of um, uh, thinking that America's interest lies in this eternal war going on in the Middle East, uh, perpetuating Israel's ambitions over there. What people really want at the end of the day is peace. And uh, this has been uh, shown recently in, uh, in the Slovakian elections, because this goes beyond also just um, America. This goes to, to other countries as well. So I'll share my screen here. This is published by the Irish Times. Um, this man has been elected. Peter Pellegrini, a, um, uh, a former premier and member of FICO's ruling coalition, got a majority of the vote and ended up beating out somebody who is more pro-European. And he is supportive of Russia. And I, I've been talking to some people from Eastern Europe recently, and it's, it's a major issue over there because people don't want to see a war with Russia. We've talked before about how NATO has continually threatened that as soon as this conflict gets even a little bit cooler, Ukraine is going to join NATO. If that happens, World War III is almost inevitable. We don't want to see this. I think what we should be promoting is a reconciliation with uh, even countries like Iran and countries like Russia in order to promote peace across the world. Each country should uh, defend its own interests, and of course it's more complicated in the Israel-Hamas issue. But at the end of the day, it, for the United States and for uh, other uh, powerful Western countries, their interests don't lie in perpetuating these wars in Ukraine and Israel. No, and it's interesting. I mean, again, I don't know a lot about this politician. He's probably not perfect. But at least what we're seeing with politicians like this is – people are, are sort of fed up with the status quo. And sometimes that's the first step before they find the answer. They they at least are fed up with with what's going on. And that's at least seems to be happening in uh, yet another Eastern European country, Slovakia. Yeah. And it's not an endorsement of, as as you mentioned, yeah. Brian, it's not an endorsement of, of this man and everything he says. Almost every politician is going to be flawed in, in, in major uh, ways. But as you mentioned, it's it's a step towards a getting rid of this establishment that seems more focused on um, uh, out, mm. out extra national um, groups rather than focusing on our own countries, promoting prosperity and promoting peace in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, again, there you have quite a roundup of events going on in the world. Um, a lot of confusion out of the Vatican, confusion out of the Trump campaign, um, but you know some some progress, um, some you know small victories in some areas, and um, that's the way things I think are going to be progressing for for a while. Maybe a one step forward, two step back, um, but I think we're probably in for a, a more seismic change by the end of this year. I mean, as I said, I think this election, um, it's almost a a, a a um, uh, cliche, but uh, is one of the more important in the history of this country. I think it's, you know, going to come down to a watershed moment of decision uh, where we may see acceleration of change in one direction uh, or or the other, and and really that's what we need to pray pray um, for our Lady's intercession. There was a prayer we um, posted on our website a while ago that. Uh, Archbishop Vigano wrote a couple of years ago during the pandemic for 
presidents and leaders of states. Uh, prayers like that, I think, are more important, you know, right now as we're in this uh, in this election cycle, particularly. Um, and so, as you heard, also, please continue to come back. We have a lot of new content we're adding to our our channel. Uh, as as you mentioned, you're over there on location uh, in Ireland, and we're hoping you may have some. Uh, more content to share when you get back from your from your time there. So if our, you keep watching, make sure to subscribe to our channels. That way you'll be notified when a new video or audio podcast is posted and you won't uh, won't miss one. For sure. So let's again end by turning all these to the hands of our, our Blessed Mother. Traditionally, uh, again, Protestants get upset about this, but traditionally the church has always believed that uh, the first person to whom our Lord appeared uh, when he rose was his mother. Um, and, and it's interesting. We posted on our website an article by a, a priest explaining that it makes you know perfect sense if you read the gospel accounts, but that the intimacy of that moment of the mother and son meeting is is veiled, is put behind a veil, but it's present in that he argues that um, our Lord is not in the tomb. So when the women get there, uh, he's not there in the tomb. They, they don't see him. They don't see him at all. He's not with the apostles because when they run back, the apostles haven't seen him. So where is he? He's risen. He's not in limbo. He's risen from the dead. Where would he be? And the only answer the priest says is he, he's with his mother. Because when Mary Magdalene goes back, he's in the garden. She sees him. Well, he was somewhere between those two points. And as the church had always, at tradition had always held, he went to see uh, his mother. So if we know that is how close his mother is to him, if we go to her under her mantle to, to pray to her, uh, we, will, uh, we will get through whatever the world and uh, the church throws at us. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. <laughs> Excuse me. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal Father, offer the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved Son has said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Saint Leo the Great. Pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Our Lady of Good Success. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Hopefully, uh, you'll, you'll be back in uh, physical uh, sight next week. You'll get to see both of us and not just have to look at me. Uh, have a safe trip back from Ireland, and uh, God bless. God bless.